Good morning, everyone, or good evening, good afternoon, as the case may be. I still see um, a number of attendees joining the room, but I suggest I take maybe two minutes to introduce myself and get the ball rolling. My name is Jamie Boex. I am the Executive Director of the Local Public Sector Alliance. And before we jump into today's program, I just want to say a few brief words about the Local Public Sector Alliance. As some of you may know, LPSA, or the Alliance, is a global alliance of advocates for inclusive and efficient decentralization and localization. Our aim is to connect professionals across countries, across disciplines, and across institutions who understand that the grand challenges that countries face in the 21st century cannot be solved by any one government level alone. What binds us members of the Alliance together is that we understand that inclusive and effective multi-level governance systems are needed to ensure that stakeholders at all levels can work together to collectively solve these challenges. With this shared understanding, LPSA, through the Asia Expert Working Group, through our other regional and thematic working groups, and through our partners and members, seek to elevate the global debate on decentralization and localization through three interrelated efforts, knowledge development, knowledge sharing, and outreach convening and field building. Today's webinar, for instance, as part of our knowledge sharing efforts is organized by the Local Public Sector Alliance, together with a number of global and regional partners, including the Asia Foundation, Oxford Policy Management, the Forum of Federations, DLOG, and our colleagues and partners at USAID. First, let me thank all of our partner organizations, as well as today's moderator, presenters, and panelists for sharing their time, knowledge, and experience. As part of our ambition to elevate the debate on decentralization, the objective of today's conversation is to learn about Indonesia's experience with fiscal decentralization over the, two past, or over the past two decades. In doing so, we do not want to just promote any single view or single approach to decentralization. Instead, we understand decentralization and localization not as a goal in itself, but rather as a means to an end. For instance, to prevent political polarization, to achieve a more inclusive society, or to promote better services. This means that we're not only interested in understanding the state of decentralization in Indonesia, but also want to understand why. What are the political economy forces that drove decentralization reforms, or the lack thereof, as the case may be? And what lessons does that have for different countries in the region? In any case, we thank you very much for joining us today. I would like to once again thank today's moderator, presenters, and panelists for their willing willingness to be part of today's webinar. I want to especially recognize Renata Samatupong not only for suggesting today's topic, but also for being a great colleague and friend for close to 25 years. Special thanks also go to Nicola Nixon, who will be moderating today's session. Nicola is the Director of Governance at the Asia Foundation and a true expert on governance and decentralization in her own right, with extensive experience in Indonesia and throughout Asia. With those brief introductory words, let me now pass the session to Nicola. Thank you very much, Jamie. And thank you also for the opportunity to be here this evening and to be part of this webinar on two decades of decentralization in Indonesia. I also want to welcome everyone uh, and wish you greetings from Hanoi, which is where I'm calling in from this evening. Um, as we get started, please feel free to go ahead and introduce yourselves in the chat. Perhaps even tell us a little bit about what's brought you along to this discussion today. To the extent possible with things like this, we'd like to have at least some interaction with our audience, um, recognising that we now have close to 100 people on the call. Um, we have a packed agenda and we have six amazing speakers and panellists this evening. Um, so in the interests of time, we'll, we'll move quite quickly into the first presentations. Now, as Jamie said, tonight we're interested in the state of decentralisation, but not only that. Um, the state of decentralization in Indonesia, but also the political economy forces that drive decentralization reforms or the lack thereof in Indonesia and beyond. Tonight, we're also joined by decentralization experts and practitioners from India, the Philippines and Pakistan, who will reflect on some of the comparative experiences of decentralization across countries and what we can learn from those. As Jamie also mentioned, we're interested here not only in the process of decentralization, but the outcomes it produces or the outcomes that are aspired to. And these may include improved governance, local development, citizen participation, administrative efficiency, conflict management, among other aspirational goals, depending on the context. A discussion of these local level dynamics across countries 
this horizontal network that the LPSA does such an incredible job in convening can also take us beyond the constraints of national level political economies and amplify cross-country comparisons, connections and lessons in a way that challenges traditional notions of nation-based geopolitics. And that's one of the reasons I was super excited to be asked to join this conversation. And the other is that I'm really looking forward to learning from our speakers. We start by looking in depth at the case of Indonesia. Since the 1998 reformasi process, Indonesia has decentralized and granted wide ranging autonomy to its subnational governments. And we're going to hear now from a little bit more about the successes and challenges in that process from our first two speakers. We're fortunate to be joined by two decentralization specialists. Our first presentation will be from Renata Sima, uh, Simatupang. Renata is currently the chief party of USAID's Economic Growth Support Activity Project, which is implemented by DevTech Systems. She has over 20 years experience working in the development sector in Indonesia, especially on local government finances and infrastructure development and borrowing. Renata has a PhD in public finance from George State University in the USA. Our second presentation will be from Erman Rahman. Erman is a colleague of mine at the Asia Foundation, and he is the activity director for USAID's IRAT program, Strengthening Local Government Effectiveness in Indonesia. His previous roles include director of the Asia Foundation's local and economic governance programs. Um, and from 2002 to 2008, Erman was project lead at the World Bank Jakarta office on governance and social service delivery. Erman has a master's in transportation from Northwest University. So both are extremely knowledgeable and experienced on this topic. Uh, for this evening's presentation, Renata will focus on uh, a retrospective on fiscal decentralization. So the transfer, more of a focus on the transfer of financial resources from central to local level and how that's played out over the last 20 years. While Eman will complement that in his presentation with a critical look at the administrative and political dimensions of decentralization in Indonesia. So more along the lines of the transfer of administrative powers and functions and the devolution of decision-making authority, bringing us up to the present day and including and beyond the controversial omnibus law of 2020 that threatens to reduce the authority of regional and local governments in certain areas. After the two presentations, we'll pause briefly for a question or two, if you'd like to put one in the chat, um, before moving to a discussion among our pan panellists. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Renata's presentation and hand over to you, Renata. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicola and Jamie, for the kind uh, introduction. Um, hello, everyone. I'm happy to see um, friends and past colleagues uh, current colleagues um, joining this session today, and I will start my presentation. I will share my screen. Perfect. So uh, as Nicola mentioned earlier, I will focus on the past two decades of fiscal decentralization experience in Indonesia, uh, starting from 2001 until 2020. Uh, so, hence the title Two Decades of Fiscal Decentralization in Indonesia. And this is the outline of my presentation. Uh, I will start with a bit of introduction and achievement of decentralization in the past two decades and key features of what makes the decentralization in Indonesia uh, different or unique compared to maybe in other countries, which we will hear from uh, India and Philippines uh, from the panelists and then reflection on the past uh, experience. Uh, Nicola already introduced a little bit on the history of fiscal decentralization in Indonesia. So in this presentation, uh, I will provide reflection on two decades implementation of fiscal decentralization uh, from 2001 until to 20, uh, 2020, outlining key features, dynamic achievements, and lessons learned from the past two decades. Uh, this study uh, was conducted by USA EXA in collaboration with Fiscal Policy Agency of Minister of Finance of Indonesia, uh, where we review the past experience to inform future policies 
ebook is available in Bahasa Indonesia and English on this link. And I would like to give credit to the team of authors, uh, Ferry Prasetya, Tengku Halil, and Tiara Suwardi from USAID EXA uh, in collaboration with Ubaidi Hamidi and Dewi Puspita from the Fiscal Policy Agency. So I will focus on the fiscal part uh, while Erman will uh, speak about the administrative and political decentralization, which together combine uh, as part of the decentralization reform started in 2001. This is the milestones of some key regulation. As you can see, uh, we started with the defining regulation in 1999, but we didn't stop there. Uh, the government continuously amending, improving, evaluating the current policy and updating the regulation. There is actually one major regulation that just passed last year, which is the law on uh, fiscal relation between uh, levels of governments, but that's beyond the scope of this discussion. And I'm sure that Erman will touch uh, on that subject later on. So the biggest question, of course, does fiscal decentralization works in Indonesia? Does it deliver? And this is what we achieved in the, in the past two decades. We can see that regional economic development, poverty rate, uh, HDI have improved, but disparity persists and it's even widened uh, horizontal disparity. On key sectors like education and health, we see improvement in some uh, indicators, um, and especially from spending. Indonesia has a mandatory spending level for education and health, which is 20% of uh, total spending for education and 10% 10, uh, 10 uh, total spending for health. And most of local governments in Indonesia has passed those thresholds. Uh, so from the quantitative side, we have reached that level, but uh, issues that relatively low quality of spending. From infrastructure, there's a marked improvement in the quantity of uh, infrastructure being constructed, you know, length of road, uh, access to clean water, things like that. But there's a relatively low quality of output. And from the PFM capacity, we can see um, in, uh, improvement in PFM capacity at the local government level. Uh, I mean, we have more than 500 local governments in Indonesia, and most of them can produce a standardized local budget and financial reporting. That's a major undertaking for a country the size of Indonesia and as diverse as Indonesia. And we see that lower, uh, there's a lower dependency to transfer, increased local revenue. So there's an improvement in PFM capacity. But again, disparity persists. Uh, between the highest performing uh, local governments like Jakarta compared to local government with uh, lower uh, capacity, say in a rural area in Papua or in Kalimantan. This is the mapping of performance. And uh, like I mentioned in public works, you can see that um, majority part of the country is has a blue color, which is very low quality, but in education, it's uh, more or less at the high level. So this is, I think this map give a clear uh, picture of uh, how fiscal decentralization performed in the past 20 years. So what is the what are the key features of fiscal decentralization in Indonesia? We utilize the four uh, pillars of fiscal decentralization. So this is pretty much textbook, uh, which been taken and implemented in Indonesia. But the uh, defining features are, there is a clear delegation of authority from central to subnational governments, which is province and district. And this, uh, this distribution of responsibilities is legalized in the regulation. So there's clear distinction. And these responsibilities are funded. Uh, it's not just the responsibilities being transferred, but uh, no money to finance that. Uh, we have a decentralized revenue. Uh, there are some taxes and retribution being transferred from central to uh, 
subnational governments. There is a large intergovernmental transfer and there's a local on-source revenue to explore. And SNGs are empowered administratively and fiscally to create and execute their own budget uh, for routine expenditure, capital expenditure, and financing. So uh, government at the local level doesn't need somebody at the provincial level to sign on uh, buying supplies for schools, something like that, uh, because they can do that autom uh, autonomously as part of their uh, authority. And there is a continuous effort by local uh, by the central government to tweak the decentralization formula and implementation, uh, which is important because the decentralization in Indonesia is very dynamic. And uh, this is like a huge experiment over time to find what is the uh, working formula or working condition for the current uh, situation of the country. So the first one, the first pillar is the uh, delegation of authorities, uh, which is, I think, pretty standard. We have uh, absolute government affairs, concurrent and general, and there's uh, mandatory and optional responsibilities for local government. And the second pillar is revenue assignment. You can see the, um, the reform over time that prior to Fiscal decentralization, uh, province and district have a relatively limited number of uh, revenue options uh, from taxes and retribution. And with the law number 34, what used to be a closed list become an open list. And this is where uh, in the euphoria state of the beginning of fiscal decentralization, the local governments getting creative they created various new retributions and taxes, which are not all good. So inefficient and burdening local economy, that's what we observed during this period. And in 2009, uh, the government revised the regulation again, uh, taking it back to closed list. And um, this is the development of revenue assignment over time. And for uh, subnational revenue composition, it consists of transfers, on source revenue, and other revenue. We can see that transfer still dominates SNG revenue, uh, this light blue portion, although it's decreasing, uh, although at a decreasing rate. In the beginning, uh, transfer is about 80% of revenue. Now it's about 57%. And there's an increasing importance of on source revenue with the average annual growth of almost 17%. Uh, the on-source revenue mostly come from local taxes. Uh, for province, it's a vehicle registration, vehicle sales tax, and for district, property tax, property sales tax, street time retribution. And of course, in some uh, areas like Bali, which is um, uh, rely on tourism, their main source of revenue is from hotel and uh, restaurant taxes. So there's also the uh, diversity and uh, changes over different places, depending on their main source of uh, economy. And we can see that local tax uh, per GDP ratio grew from 0.79% in the beginning to 1.38%. In contrast, the national tax ratio decreased from 12% in the beginning of fiscal decentralization to 11.15% in 2019. What we observe from the decentralized revenue? First, we can see that over time, SNGs experimented, innovate to improve their local revenue. They introduced cashless and online payment, third-party payment points. We can pay uh, tax and retribution at post office, bank, convenience store, and uh, they introduced the incentive and disincentive. And streamlining local retribution, especially those who are more on the administrative burden but doesn't generate much revenue. But the challenge is low taxpayer registration and low compliance in some areas and limited human resource capacity and infrastructure, such as for updating the tax base, valuation, collection, confiscation, uh, the administrative part of the um, revenue management. And there's a weak law enforcement 
And there's a uh, dissatisfaction actually because the big ticket items such as the income tax, oil and gas are still central taxes. The next pillar is my favorite, the transfer. And it's a continuously evolving concept and implementation. So this is how the Ministry of Finance categorize our transfer. There's a balancing fund, uh, which purpose is to uh, improve the imbalance between regions, which consists of general allocation grant or DAU, revenue sharing, and specific allocation grant. And there is a special autonomy fund uh, for Papua, Aceh, and Yogyakarta. Uh, the new kids on the block, which is the village fund introduced in 2015, and there is a fiscal incentive. Uh, those blue boxes, the amount of transfer is regulated by the law. So a certain percentage of something. Uh, whereas the uh, say DAK, village fund, the amount is discretionary of the central government and depending on uh, the allocation criteria at that time. So we can see here is the evolution of transfer and village fund over time. Uh, the beginning in 20, uh, 2001, DAU and uh, revenue sharing is a pure block grant, but over time, uh, central government introduced some earmark. So uh, I can say that we no longer have a pure block grant here because there's always a earmark or a regulation uh, tied to the transfer. And you can see that since 2016, there's notable changes in technical requirements for balancing fund. Uh, the amount of transfer has increased significantly uh, since 2001. It has uh, increased 10 times from 81 trillion to 813 trillion in 2019. Of course, there's a decrease in 2020 because of COVID. Um, but uh, we can see that there's a diminishing share of balancing fund or transfer to SNG revenue as we discussed earlier. And these are. Uh, these are the major uh, transfers, uh, the general purpose or DAU and revenue sharing and DBH, which contribute more than 50% of total transfer, but uh, it's in, their importance are diminishing over time uh, with this line. You can see that it's downward sloping. And DAK, uh, this is a specific uh, transfer for infrastructure. Now it has two components, the physical DAK and non-physical DAK. The physical DAK is actually decreasing. Uh, now it's less than 10% of total transfer, but the non-physical one is increasing. The non-physical DAK provides operational support to basic services. And on pillage fund, which was introduced back in 2015, uh, is still finding the best formula for allocation. Funds come from central and district government, and uh, the purpose is to support village development, such as village infrastructure, health posts, local markets, and things like that. And to access this fund, village administration must prepare and get their budget approved by district government. So we can see that there's also attempt to improve the PFM capacity at the village level. And uh, as you can see, the allocation has been increasing significantly from the starting point in 2015. And there's a significant increase in output, such as number of village uh, facilities constructed using this money. So what can we see from the transfer? So transfer remains the largest revenue for SNG, although uh, its importance is diminishing. And there is a positive correlation between DAU and personal expenditure because it is one of the component of the formula. And uh, we can see that the resource rich regions, uh, the one who received the largest share of uh, reven revenue sharing, tends to neglect other economic sectors. So they are vulnerable to community price fluctuation and uh, global economic downturn. And we can see that the uh, specific transfer, DEK, is becoming more varied over year. Uh, resulted in smaller share for each uh, district 
and the amount is insufficient to finance a full project. So sometimes, you know, they uh, the local government will use that only for improvement, but there's not enough money to build uh, the whole house using this uh, transfer. And uh, there's a difficulty to measure the performance of um, some uh, most of these transfers. And the autonomy fund for Papua is still lagging, mostly due to governance problem. And again, we can see the ever-changing criteria for local incentive fund created unclear signal for SNGs on which performance being evaluated and rewarded. The next pillar is on the expenditure. This is the development of uh, expenditure category. Now we have three categories, which is operation, capital expenditure, and transfer. Uh, as you can see from this graph, that most of the spending in Indonesia happens at the district or city level, which is um, more than twice than the province level. But again, from the revenue, uh, from the uh, responsibility assignments, district has more recent, uh, responsibilities than province. That's why most of the spending happens at the district level. We can see here uh, expenditure that in district and cities, more than 40% is used for personal expenditure because they have more uh, local public service uh, compared to province. And this is what uh, has been highlighted, that capital expenditure is significantly less at 20%. And by function, uh, as uh, I've discussed earlier, both for health and education, um, district and cities have passed the local threshold of 20% uh, for education and 10% for health. And for uh, public service infrastructure, the proportion of uh, spending for this sector is relatively low compared to other key sectors. And uh, this is my second favorite um, pillar of decentralization, talking about the financing. Uh, by regulation, SNGs are allowed to borrow, uh, but not directly from foreign sources, uh, to finance deficit or development project. Uh, they will need to prepare a proposal for, for this loan and send it to Ministry of Finance and Home Affairs to review and approve. And local parliament also needs to approve the borrowing plan. And, Regulations are actually in place for borrowing from different sources, including for municipal bonds issuance, but the realization is relatively low because of the above mentioned review and approval process. And right now, SNGs mostly borrow from central government, regional development banks, uh, regional as in their local region, not like ADB or uh, that region, and SOE, Infrastructure Financing Agency. As of now, there is no municipal bond issuance yet. So what do we take from the expenditure side? By type, uh, expenditure for personnel still dominates, although decreased significantly from 70% in the beginning to 33% in 2020. And capital expenditure is still relatively low. Um, education and health expenditure mostly have exceeded the mandatory level. But again, the uh, next question is about the quality of expenditure. Okay. So the overall observation from two decades of experience. I can safely say that fiscal decentralization in Indonesia delivers. And it only happened because it's supported by political and administrative decentralization. Fiscal decentralization do bring service closer to the people. Uh, we can, uh, we can see the uh, quantity of surface infrastructure uh, uh, increasing significantly, but quality of surface and infrastructure should be improved. And uh, the next observation is intergovernmental transfer is a powerful fiscal tool to ensure basic public service delivery, although there needs some reworking on the incentive and disincentive and formula. And uh, there's an there has been an underutilization of SNG financing and borrowing options. This uh, caused the second tier SNGs 
um, less access to have large scale project because they don't have sufficient uh, fiscal capacity, but maybe they are not that empowered to borrow. And from the performance, uh, performance side, there is a weak performance measure because there's a lacking performance in, uh, performance framework. Uh, we can see that good performance did not influence future transfer. So, and this is coupled with a weak MNE from higher level of government. So it's not just from the central government, but from province to district and district to village, which is supposed to work that way in, in, in tier, right? But that doesn't happen yet. And there's a weak fiscal planning and coordination with central and other SNG, which created disjointed projects, overlapping program. The question is who should lead the coordination? We think that this is the role of province government. They should take this role. And we can observe that SNG's uh, PFM capacity improved over time. Again, uh, 500 plus local governments in Indonesia, uh, most of them has the ability to produce standardized budget and financial report. And we can see improved local revenue power, lower dependency to transfer. So these are the overall observation from two decades of experience. And our study uh, creates this policy recommendation. First of all, of course, uh, transfer fund management needs to be improved uh, with the purpose to narrow fiscal capacity disparity and encourage improvement in SNG expenditure. And future fiscal decentralization policy should strengthen, should strengthen local taxing power while continuing to encourage investment and ease of doing business. And a reallocation of regional expenditure needs to happen from mostly for personnel to financing optimal public service delivery. Public financial management planning, including planning for financing, needs to be strengthened. And harmonization of fiscal policy between central and SNGs to accelerate the achievement of development objectives. And the last uh, recommendation is to strengthen the MNE uh, system. So result from uh, MNE and input from community could be useful to inform policy formulation and allocation of transfer. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. I will return uh, the screen to Nicola. Thank you. Thank you very much, Renata. Thank you for such a, an insightful and informative presentation. Um, there are already some questions coming in on the chat. However, I think what we'll do is we'll move on to Erman's presentation. Um, and then at the end of that presentation, we'll respond to some of these questions. But also, Renata, if you have time or the inclination to respond to some of them in the chat, you're also very welcome to do so. So now we're going to hand over to Erman on decentralization in Indonesia looking towards the future. Thank you, Erman. Uh, thank you, Nicola. Uh, can you hear me well and see my slide? Can hear you very, very clearly and see the okay. slide. So please go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you, everyone. Uh, good evening. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for having me here uh, uh, tonight. Today, I will uh, present uh, the uh, decentralization in Indonesia, uh, particularly on the district administrative and political decentralization. And my presentation will uh, include like three main uh, sections. One is the context and results of decentralization in Indonesia. I think Renata has mentioned a lot of them uh, already, so I will just complement what she said. And I, I will discuss about issues on the implementation of decentralization. And then uh, I, I will conclude with the recommendations for the future. Similar to Renata, uh, the project that I lead, uh, USAID RAP, uh, Effective, Efficient, and Strong uh, Local Governance, uh, conducted an assessment uh, uh, on local governance and public service delivery uh, in 2021. So my presentation will be largely drawn for that uh, assessment. 
Okay, um, I think we we have discussed a lot about the the beginning of the current decentralization because we we were decentralized in the past, like in the in the beginning of the uh, in and I think in the fifties we were we were also decentralized, but the the current one was uh, started in 1998 reformasi and i think i want to highlight the fact that uh, we uh, initially decentralized mainly to the district level and the main um, uh, uh, reason for that was that like uh, at, the, at that time in, in late 90s there was like a balkanization of eastern europe independence of timor leste that really uh, create like a concern for the for the government of indonesia and I wanted to focus on, uh, uh, on uh, decentralization at the at the district level, and also uh, at the time the democratization, uh, the very strong demand for for democratization and uh, local legislative council was was uh, really empowered, uh, like with uh, impeaching uh, uh, um, authority. Uh, local legislative councils can impeach the the the, the mayor or regent, uh, the head of district. Uh, so and then uh, in two thousand four. We enhanced this by direct elections of mayors, regents, and governors uh, in in 2004. All the 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 the, the power of the local legislative councils was uh, reduced then. In the past 20 years plus, uh, the uh, the policies have been continuously adjusted. As uh, Renata said, like uh, issuance of village law, uh, change uh, decentralized uh, further to the village level, and there was like a decentralized uh, uh, land and property tax through the revision of the uh, local taxes and and user charges in 2009. But we also see like a recentralization trend, like since 2004, 2014, we tried to build the capacity of the governor and uh, as a representative of the central government to uh, review the plans, budgets, and policies of the district uh, district governments or local governments. Since 2014, secondary education, you know, natural resource management is taken away from, from the district government to the, to, the, to the provincial level. And since 2009, uh, district government, uh, as Renata said, uh, doesn't have uh, doesn't have any more authority to determine the types of local taxes and and levies. It uh, basically becomes like a closed system. And in 2020, the omnibus law, uh, the it's actually a law to promote like uh, employment, uh, creates like an opportunity of the central government of higher level government to overrule subnational uh, spatial plans for the sake of the. Uh, the, the central government priorities. And in 2022, the new uh, uh, law on, on um, fiscal relations between central and local subnational governments put like tighter restrictions on the utilization of, of, of central transfers to the, to the district. So as we can see, there are several um, development and and uh, we we see like a pretty much like a recentralization trend in the past uh, few years. In terms of the government government structure, the administrative structure resulted from the decentralization. This slide shows the uh, very simplified structure. The blue boxes and circles uh, show the executive branch of government, while the red ones are the legislative. The circles represent elected officials, while the boxes are appointed. And as you can see here, sorry, there is a typo here. It should be district offices. Basically, we have three tiers of, of, of governments, uh, like uh, the, the uh, central, provincial, and district level. And the difference between uh, urban uh, local government or, or, or city or municipalities and, and region regencies is that like, um, at the at the urban uh, level, we have like a, a ward uh, instead of village, which uh, which is basically appointed by the district government and and uh, accountable to the sub district and subsequently to the the local government. While in rural districts, we have villages, which has uh, a pretty uh, pretty high authority and uh, and also like a pretty pretty high uh, fiscal uh, transfer to the the villages as well. And in addition to this 
general um, uh, general administration administration structure. We also have like the so-called asymmetric decentralization. Several provinces uh, such as Jakarta Special Capital Region, uh, Yogyakarta Special Region, and uh, several provinces have like special autonomy status. Aceh, Papua, West Papua, and new provinces of South, South Papua, Central Papua, Mountains Papua, and the most recent one, Southwest Papua, have basically uh, special autonomy status. In most cases, it's like basically strengthening the, the fiscal capacity of the provincial uh, governments. And in Jakarta, it's uh, very special because uh, like basically it's uh, the, the, the autonomy is at the, at the provincial level. I think I'm going to skip this slide of the distribution of functions, uh, as uh, Renata has already has already uh, indicated in her presentation. Now about the development outcomes, uh, I I haven't reconciled with Renata about, about the the stories here, which is slightly different what, uh, with what she said, but I guess. Uh, she was looking at the data like a like a older data while while I'm looking at like part in particularly like from to 2015 to to the most recent one to 2022. But uh, basically, this slide shows like um shows like the the several uh, development outcomes indicators, uh, GDP per capita, province uh, poverty rate, uh, HDI human development index, as well as gender development index. And as you can see, uh, in most cases, uh, the, the trend is what we expected. If you see the columns, the gray columns, uh, GDP per capita increase, poverty rate after increasing in 2015 uh, decrease, and, and the HDI and GDI increase. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the most important point I want to show here is that, in general, we expect that decentralization brings convergence among, among, among local governments, creating opportunities for low performing districts or provinces to catch up with the, with the, with, with the others. And uh, uh, the, 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 the red li uh, line in this graph uh, basically show the standard deviation. So the smaller the standard deviation, that means like a more converging, more closer it's to the means, to the, to the average. And as you can see here, other than GDP per capita, uh, but in most cases, uh, the, the, the development outcomes converges this, in this case, like among provinces. But uh, 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 when we see like a district level, uh, district level uh, convergence, uh, standard deviations also show, show convergence. This is again, like uh, slightly different from what, from what uh, Renata said, but I think it is due to the, the, the period of the observation. Because, like, uh, I think most scholars uh, identified that uh, this, this such uh, the convergence didn't really happen prior to 2014. So we can look at the data uh, uh, in more detail. Now I will discuss uh, several aspects of decentralization, but particularly the administrative and political aspect of it. One is about the the missing middle, the roles of the governor to monitor and support the districts. In the Indonesia case, the governor, not the provincial government, uh, is uh, has like a dual roles. One is a, as a leader of autonomous provincial government uh, to implement provincial uh, functions, decentralized functions that are, uh, and she or he are, uh, is helped by by the provincial government offices, and uh, the province has like a provincial budget. But the governor also has a role as a representative of the central government to monitor and assist district governments. So uh, it is like a playing at the concentrated functions. And based on the law, it should be implemented by government units separated from the provincial government and financed by the state budget. However, this has not been fully implemented. The central government hasn't provided adequate budget and doesn't support the, uh, the, the governor to establish a separate uh, units uh, outside the, the provincial government. So the monitoring of like the three governments are wholeheartedly implemented by the provincial governments at, at this point, 
with funding mix from like a limited the concentrated budget from the central government as well as the provincial budget. The second uh, thing is which I think um, uh, Renata also uh, talks uh, a lot about the lack of quality MNE and as well as the support to the national governments, the subnational governments. And uh, I saw Gabe is, uh, is uh, attending this, this meeting and we just had like a, an assessment of a central government, several central government and systems and, and see uh, what it should be uh, and what, uh, uh, how, how they are, uh, they, they, are uh, uh, they are implemented in practice. So in theory, central government should have like a, a coherent MNS systems, uh, Ministry of Home Affairs, basically coordinating other ministries, including Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Administrative and Bureaucracy Reform, BAPNAS, the National Development Planning Agency, as well as sectoral ministries to monitor the performance of the provincial governments and through the governors as the representative of the central government, monitor the performance of the district governments. But unfortunately, this hasn't happened in practice. So what happened is that uh, all the, uh, the, the, the central government ministries, even like uh, various components units within the ministries implement their own uh, MNE system and mostly requires, uh, require uh, subnational governments to provide report uh, to them in an uncoordinated way that creates like a lot of burden, administrative burden for the subnational governments. And the role of the governor or provincial governments to monitor the district governments, as I mentioned earlier, uh, is, is very limitedly Im implemented. And more importantly with this, uh, 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 lack of like a good quality MNE systems is the utilization of the results of the MNE uh, either to incentivize a local government, which uh, is getting better over time, although Renata is quite critical about that, but also uh, more importantly is to support the, 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 the less performing ones. The support system hasn't, hasn't, uh, hasn't happened yet. Next, I'm talking about the favorite issue in uh, in uh, Indonesia's uh, decentralization is the proliferation, or in Indonesian term, it's pemakaran. Uh, uh, so technically, establishment of new autonomous regions will bring services closer to the people, but Subnational elites also have like stronger incentives. Fiscally, everything else being equal, two autonomous regions will receive higher amount of funds uh, transfers than one uh, autonomous region. Politically, new region would need more uh, political and uh, civil servant positions. Not to mention uh, the need for infrastructure development after proliferation. So within four years after 99, uh, decentralization laws were, were enacted. The numbers of regencies and municipalities were uh, increased by 48% or almost by 50%, while the provinces uh, were expanded by 27%. And there is no clear consensus among scholars whether proliferation brings positive or negative outcomes. Hence, the government applied like a moratorium of a proliferation since 2006. However, as seen in the, in the graph, uh, it is not fully enforced as the numbers of regions still increased by 17% in 2007, uh, 2007 to 2022 period. Uh, the, the latest one is the establishment of four new provinces in, in, Papua, uh, in Papua. Next is about governance. I think uh, the reformasi era since 98, uh, particularly in the first decade, brought about significant progress in the instit institutionalizing uh, the governance, including on freedom of information, public participation, gender equality and social inclusion, through various laws and regulation, establishment of institutions, and development and rollout of applications such as com national complaint handling systems. However, the implementation of the established systems and institutions have been inconsistent, both ge geographically and among different sectors. For example, inadequate consultations prior to law and policy making. 
slow and inadequate responses to complaints, limited budget and institutional support provided to implement regulatory framework. Planning and budgeting system is still very complicated and at the end of the day have been fully implemented. And uh, so this, like uh, there are a lot of problems on, on the, the, the implementations of such like a, a institutionalized um, uh, uh, local governance, uh, governance reform. So we 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 look at the the situation uh, in in more detail, and we see the difference between institutionalization and implementation. In the impl institutionalization, instead, in addition to like a strong momentum from the ninety eight reformasi, there was like a very strong demand from civil society to institutionalize reform. And uh, we also see that like when we try to institu institutionalize one one aspect of reform. Basically, we, we only need to, to focus on like one sector, for example, on improving gender responsive planning and budgeting, for instance, we only focus on Ministry of like Women Empowerment. While in the implementation, this gender responsive planning and budgeting must be implemented by all ministries, all subnational governments, and all sectors as well. So there is like a bigger, much bigger challenge in, in implementing the, 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 the regulations. And moreover, uh, the institutions that are responsible to monitor, to enforce the, the institutions are relatively powerless compared to other sectors. For example, this, again, my favorite Ministry of Women Empowerment, vis a -vis Ministry of Public Works, for instance. So this is like a, a, a adding the, the complication uh, in, in implementing uh, such uh, pretty good uh, uh, regulations, laws, regulations, and 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 and, and institutions. Now, when we look at the subnational leaders and officials in general, we found like a three common incentives for for them. One is nationally recognized. So that also shows that like a central government still matters to them. And then of course, because they are directly elected, political popularity, popularity to the constituents is important, but also like uh, this opportunity for corruption is also still like a very uh, strong among, among the subnational leaders and, and, and officials. And uh, some of their actions can also serve more than one incentive. For example, winning national level competition getting unqualified audit opinions, adopting digital transformation, even publicly showing the disagreement with central government can serve both national uh, national recognition as also like constitution, uh, constitution recognition. Uh, promotion of uh, infrastructure and natural resource-based economic development as well as provision of social assistance and grants can increase both their political popularity, populism, and also create opportunity to corrupt, specifically for the provincial governments, due to the historical framework of the 99 uh, decentralization that emphasized the district level. They also have incentives to increase their relevance and influence vis-a-vis -vis, uh, local governments. The last section of uh, my presentation is about uh, what we can do, what can recommend for the future of decentralization in Indonesia. First, we see several factors that support deepening of decentralization in Indonesia. In 2014, Joko Widodo was elected president. He was the first, he is the pr first president who did not build his political career as Jakarta elite. He started as a mayor in Solo and was elected as the governor of Jakarta uh, prior to the running and winning the presidential election. His, sub his subnational path is followed by most of the candidates of, for the next uh, ele presidential election in next year. Second, as we discussed a lot uh, this tonight, uh, decentralization also shows positive outcomes. It successfully avoided balkanization that we were very afraid about. Uh, 20 plus years ago. And it also shows like a relatively positive results in reducing interregional disparity as well as access to public services. Although the quality of services, I think in general, we agree it's still uh, an issue. Lastly, the power of subnational leaders is getting stronger. 
although generally uh, fragmented. But we also uh, have like some uh, constraining factors. Uh, one is the lack of momentum and political incentives for Jakarta elites to promote decentralization. So people start forgetting how centralistic uh, administration was, and then competing political populism interests between central and subnational leaders. And decentralization is also perceived to slow down decision making and hence development progress. And at the same time, we also see regression of democracy, which um, complement decentralization. The second uh, constraining factor is all uh, is that like most of central government ministries, twenty plus years down the road, have not really internalized and fully supported decentralization. They still have like their own organization structure and budgets to implement activities which are under the authorities of the subnational governments. And lastly, but bad decentralization news is good news. Uh, like for example, these days we we uh, Indonesia so, uh, we talk a lot about high corruption at the subnational level, which uh, undermine the, the 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 existence of like a big corruption at the central level as well. No, we look at the uh, the the new vision of Indonesia. Uh, I think. Uh, in general, the, the government is like uh, looking forward to having this Indonesia's 2045 vision, 100 years after the independence of a sovereign, developed, and sustainable maritime state. And how we the decentralization will contribute to, to realize this vision, our recommendation is to focus on specifically reducing interregional disparity and inequity. And uh, in this case, the one principle of asymmetric decentralization, I think we need to expand it beyond the, the, spa uh, the spatial autonomy regions, but also to really look at the, at the situation, the different characteristics of, of the subnational governments, urban, rural, um, 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 coastal and non-coastal, uh, more high fiscal capacity and less uh, low fiscal capacity, as well as like uh, focusing on the disadvantage in terms of regions as well as like community groups. More specifically, one thing that we often forget is that there is an important central level reforms uh, harmonizing laws and regulations and part in particular uh, non-decentralization laws there are a lot of like non-decentralization laws which still like um, showing centralized uh, um, centralized principle and then uh, uh, further the uh, 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 conduct the, the, the bureaucracy reform to remove like central level positions and budgets and which are under the authority of subnational governments, as well as strengthening anti-corruption interventions. Without this this uh, uh, anti-corruption strengthening, I mean like all these problems will continue happening on the ground. Second is about intergovernmental. I think simplifying MNE systems and reorient from inputs to results, I think it's very important. And most important, more importantly, is to utilize them to incentivize and to provide the aid to subnational governments. Clarifying and enhancing the intermediate roles of the governor or provincial government, peer-to-peer -peer learning to scale up innovations and good practices, as well as like enhancing the use of uh, specific allocation grants or DAK to reduce disparity, and to implement public service oriented general allocation grant, the AEU and performance based incentive funds. These are the two features of the new uh, fiscal relations law uh, between central and subnational governments, which are pretty good in theory, but it is very difficult in practice because of the, the lack of uh, quality MNE system I talked about late, uh, earlier. Finally, at the local level, improving governance, access to information, public participation, gender equality and social inclusion that can improve quality of public policies, programs and budgets to improve access to and quality of public services, as well as to promote collaboration with civil society and private sector to improve public service delivery, governance and inclusion. Thank you. I'm looking forward to discussing uh, this uh, with all of you tonight or this morning. Thank you. Back to you, Nicola. Thank you very much, Eman. Um, and thank you for such a rich and detailed 
presentation. Um, you've clearly struck a chord with quite a few in the audience. We have some very knowledgeable people also in, uh, in the audience on Indonesian decentralization. And I want to thank Renata, who has been very studiously responding to, to several questions um, in the chat. And maybe, Erman, if you have a, a moment, if you wouldn't mind also having a, a bit of a look at what's been coming in. Um, we'll, we'll move on to the panel now. Um, in the interests of time. So tonight we have uh, with us experts from four different contexts who will share their re uh, reflections on what resonates with them in the presentations that we've just heard and what kind of lessons we might learn about decentralization from a comparative perspective. We're joined by, um, and I'll just go through our four panellists, we have um, MP Marianne Arnado, who was recently appointed by the President of the Philippines in, in late August 2022 as a member of the Bangsamoro Transition Authority. She is currently the Deputy Floor Leader of the Bangsamoro Parliament and serves as Chairperson of the Committee on Amendments. As a Member of Parliament, Marianne is committed to championing climate justice, women, labor, human rights, indigenous peoples, and promoting inclusive growth and sustainable development. Prior to her government service, um, Atia Arnaldo, Arnaldo was a lawyer specializing on indigenous peoples and land rights, as well as feminist legal advocacy and defense of human rights defenders. We are, so that, we're very, very pleased to have um, MP Marianne Anado with us this evening. Our second panelist is joining us from New Delhi, Dr. V. N. Alok. Dr. Alok is Professor of Urban Finance at the Indian Institute of Public Administration and has been there um, in New Delhi since 1999. Uh, he's also he's been a member of the Delhi Finance Commission and contributed uh, to almost all successive Union Federal and state finance commissions since 1995 in several different capacities. He's led and conducted many research studies on public policy, including the design of intergovernmental fiscal transfers, urban finance, local election reforms, dispute resolution, and commodity tax reforms. Then next we have Ravita uh, Wayudi. Ravita is a uh, consultant based with uh, Oxford Policy Management. In Jakarta, she has more than 20 years of experience working in development projects. And prior to working with OPM, she worked with the World Bank office in Jakarta, where she had an opportunity to explore decentralization issues in Indonesia in some depth. She holds a Master's of Public Policy uh, and Management from the University of Melbourne in Australia, and Ravita also joins us from Jakarta. And finally, we have um, Mujib Khan, Mujib is Principal Consultant at Oxford Policy Management, and he has over 25 years of experience in governance and public financial management as a civil servant and as a consultant. He's worked on public policy and governance reforms at the national, provincial and district levels. His recent work is leading the FCDO-funded subnational governance program in Pakistan, where he's focused on designing and implementing planning, financial management and revenue enhancement reforms and he joins us from Oxford in the UK. So thank you to all four of our panelists for making time to join us this evening. Um, I'd like to start um, with, with Marianne um, Arnado, if that's okay. Um, we are particularly uh, grateful to have a representative of the Philippines government here this evening to share your reflections. And I'm sure you've been deeply involved in both the discourse and practice of decentralization in the Philippines. Um, I wonder if you wouldn't mind please giving us your reflections on the sorts of things you've just heard about the Indonesian context and how that relates to your own experience. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Arnado. Um, thank you, Nicola, and uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Renata and Erman for a very uh, interesting presentation on the experience of uh, Indonesia. Um, uh, I just want to, uh, while uh, li uh, uh, while listening uh, to your presentation, uh, uh, we are really very interested on the topic because uh, uh, I am coming from uh, the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao, which is currently uh, undergoing a transition period 
the uh, in implementing the comprehensive agreement between the Philippine government and the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. And so during this transition period, we are uh, uh, we have two polit uh, two tracks, which is the polit the political and the normalization track. And under the political track, uh, this is where we are now currently uh, uh, legislating the local governance code for the Bangsamoro. And so this is where uh, the topic is very uh, interesting for us because uh, uh, we have a lot of questions. We have a lot of uh, confusions also on the on this topic, and we really want to be enlightened by those who have already the experience, just like uh, Indonesia. Now, so li so listening to your uh, presentation and uh, bringing this back and forth to my own uh, context, uh, I would like to uh, know, for instance, uh, whether. Um, uh, if we develop when we develop a decentralization framework, uh, will it can it be is it possible to have a blended type of uh, approach? Like uh, you have uh, aspects of uh, governance and uh, and uh, fiscal uh, and uh, fiscal policies that can be centralized in the regional or in the autonomous government. And then some aspects can be also uh, decentralized because uh, uh, the the Bangsamoro government it has already a very clear um, uh, agreement with the Philippine government with regards to the powers that are already uh, uh, exclusive to the autonomous region. There are those who are also concurrent and th there are also powers that are reserved to the national government. So right now at the regional level, we are trying to uh, pass the local government code that will uh, that will um, uh, define the the extent of decentralization that will be implemented at the local government units level. And so the question uh, among uh, some members of the parliament is really on how far can we go on the decentralization aspect, especially that we are still in the process of transition, we are still rebuilding uh, uh, the, the conflict affected areas. And even at the governance level, we really have a very uh, 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 we, uneven, uneven uh, implement, uh, uh, levels of uh, governance. Uh, so that's one. So uh, we, uh, we would like to know, for example, if we can have some sort of blended decentralization where there are some aspects of governance that are decentralized and then others are maintained as centralized at the regional or the autonomous government level. Second, I'm also keenly interested on, because you mentioned earlier in your presentation that the Special Autonomy Fund in Papua is lagging due to governance problem. So can you please uh, elaborate on that? Uh, uh, in, uh, how, how, what, what particular problem and how it, it, this is being uh, addressed uh, uh, in Indonesia? And then uh, I'm also uh, very interested on the asymmetric decentralization approach as mentioned by uh, Erman. Um, um, uh, is this particular approach um, um, uh, applicable only in the autonomous uh, autonomous governments within Indonesia, or is it applied uh, also to the to the to the other uh, districts? Um, I think these are really uh, um, our current concern, and uh, and I hope that uh, we can we can be enlightened on these questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marianne. Um, fantastic questions. I'm, I'm wondering, we will, um, perhaps er Erman and Renata, if you're thinking about responses to, to those questions, I might move on to the other panelists for now, but circle back on those on those three questions, because I believe Ravita might also have some questions for you as well. Um, so for now, then, I'd like to then ask um, Dr. Alok, 
Um, turning to you, if you could please also share your reflections on Renata and Erman's presentation pertaining to your knowledge and experience in the Indian context. Over to you, Dr. Alok. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. And thanks to Asia Foundation and USAID for having invited me. And thanks particularly to Jamie, who has just started a wonderful local public sector alliances. And uh, uh, thanks to uh, Forum of Federations, uh, Oxford Policy Management, and other groups. Uh, I congratulate, first of all, to Renata and Herman uh, for a very, very comprehensive presentations on just two decades of decentralization in Indonesia. In fact, I was on a learning curve. I, I learned quite a lot about the Indonesian's experience. Uh, uh, so, so nice. Uh, uh, there are, in fact, what I could see from these presentations, uh, commonalities between the Indian and the Indonesian cases. Like uh, the Indian constitutions came into being in 1950, whereas in Indonesia, it came in 1945. Uh, we certainly depended upon the British constitution that was in 1935, which was essentially having a federal features. Whereas the Indonesia, you started with the federal features and uh, many of you uh, did believe that this was a kind of a inflictions on the part of the Dutch. So the Sukarno uh, later on, you move towards a unity form of government. But what I could see uh, from your presentations, though your constitution is unitary in nature, but I think the working is quite federal in nature. Like we compare India with, with Indonesia, uh, you have a federal government, we do have a union government here. Uh, India, we do have about 28 states. Uh, 28 states, whereas Indonesia, 38 uh, provinces, uh, we do not really uh, have district in the constitution, but district is very, very prominent in India. And uh, uh, 766 districts here in India, whereas in, in, in Indonesia, you have about 450 not districts there. Now, we do have a union territories, about eight union territories, which is governed by, by the federal government. Uh, but down the line, uh, in India, we have quarter million rural local governments. Okay? And they all draw its powers from the district governments. Okay? It's, a, it's not really mentioned in the constitution, but it is there in the practice, like there in Indonesia, what Irman was talking about that this is what there is a the theory, this is what is there in the practice. So district is extremely important in India and I can understand uh, it's uh, the upper level of government is also very, very strong there in uh, Indonesia as well. So uh, unlike uh, municipalities you have in Indonesia, we also have municipalities and city government in India, it's about 5,000 or so. So there are three levels for big cities, uh, for not so big cities, and the transitional area from the rural to urban. Likewise, in the rural areas, we do have a district uh, local government, uh, block lo local government, and village local governments. So it's, as I said, about quarter billion or so. Now, in India, the revenue, so for the fiscal decentralization concept, revenue is quite centralized. Uh, the union government collects about 65% of the total revenue requirements, where the states collect about 35%. So far as the expenditure assignment is concerned, the state is responsible, that is a subnational government, is about 65%, and the, and the union government about 35%. So there is a fund transfer, the intergovernmental fiscal transfer that takes place. And as per the last uh, uh, Finance Commission's uh, recommendations, 41% transfers from the central revenue to the states. Now, the local governments here in India, it draws its powers from the state government. Okay. So, so uh, the funds transfer to the states and from states, this goes to the local government. Some funds are also transferred directly from the union government to the state government. Now, the question comes, uh, uh, that uh, the Indonesians uh, case, uh, I think uh, this has been mentioned by, by Irman, 
monitoring and evaluation is part of it. See, there is some statutory transfers here in India, like 41% to the states and some central revenue transfer to the local government here in India. But there are a number of schemes because there are a number of windows by which the money is transferred to the local governments. So the central agencies, they try and monitor the, the local government through that kind of transfers because they are all conditional transfers. Okay? They are not unconditional transfers. So when they, when they monitor, then of course, they do have a role. The national goals be there at the, at the, at the local level, the state level. The state also try and control the local governments. So that's question number one. The monitoring and evaluation part here in India and there in Indonesia, uh, certainly the officers, I think that at that point uh, somehow came here in the presentations. The officers, those who are appointed there, the local government, they are not really accountable to people uh, there in the community. They are accountable to the people at the higher level of government. So that is the important point. Uh, in the fiscal decentralizations, that the officers, those who are appointed by the higher level of government, to whom they are actually accountable to. Then there are a couple of other questions. I'm not going to get into that because of the paucity of time, but I think the political space uh, that you have mentioned, uh, some people, some politicians, they come from the local government, state, and then uh, acquire the central leadership. This is what is now coming up here in India, uh, the Prime Minister Modi, he was the Chief Minister of one of the states in the past. But there is another thing which is coming up. Now, states are getting powerful. So, uh, people, uh, most politicians would like to be a Chief Minister rather than becoming a Cabinet Minister in the central government. So, that is uh, uh, another point uh, that I just wanted to mention there. And uh, uh, then uh, another uh, question is about the affirmative actions. In India, the local government started in 1993 and uh, the objective of uh, creating a local government was a economic development and social justice. So many women were elected. This was gender neutral. Many women were elected, many backward class were also given the power. So they also came into, uh, I do not really know to what extent the decentralizations have addressed this kind of issue there in Indonesia. So a uh, uh, couple of these questions, uh, Nicola, I, I, I stop it here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alec. Thank you for those observations. And hopefully we'll get a chance for Renata and Erman to um, to respond to those in a moment. So I'm just mindful of the time we were going to aim to finish on the half hour. I hope for most of the participants, if you are able to, to stay on, I think probably we'll, we'll be finishing approximately 10 minutes over that time. I, um, we, we still have a little bit to cover um, and we want to make sure that we get um, all of that in. So hopefully people don't have to drop off. Um, I'll move on to, to our next panellist and I'll actually ask um, Mujib if he would share his um, reflections of his experience in Pakistan. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. Thanks very much. And, uh, um, you know, brilliant, very insightful presentations, both from Renata and Erman. Um, and, uh, yeah, a, a lot that, that I came to know about Indonesia. Uh, it's interesting. I mean, my first observation essentially is... Uh, you know, in terms of comparison between uh, uh, Indonesia and Pakistan, Pakistan uh, is also a federal country, unlike uh, uh, Indonesia, where it appears the resource distribution um, takes place at the top level, where shares are allocated to, to the provinces, as well as to the local governments. Uh, in Pakistan, um, this comes as two separate sets of uh, devolution and decentralization. The first level is between the federation and the provinces, uh, which is the equivalent of uh, yeah, uh, the same in uh, uh, Indonesia, but uh, you know, state government in India. So there, the arrangement of fiscal decentralization is through a National Finance Commission award. So that is, and it's a it's a quite a fiercely contested process. It happens every five years, and uh, both sides come together, all the federating units and the federal government. They sit together and they 
they they uh, talk about distributing resources. Uh, typically, you know, in uh, like uh, most other countries, most of the revenue is collected at the federal level, uh, and provinces do have uh, uh, some buoyant uh, sources of revenue, but their collection is uh, significantly low, and a lot of resource uh, transfer has to take place from the federal level to the to the provincial level. Uh, but the local governments, I mean, again, so decentralization in our context is in two sets. The second is between the province and the district or the governments below the district. So we have had quite a patchy record in that. Uh, in Pakistan, uh, a number of uh, uh, local government systems have been tried. Um, and unlike, again, in the case of Indonesia, where it's a, uh, a more or less a single system given uh, by the top government across the government, uh, four provinces in Pakistan uh, have come up with their own uh, individual solutions, uh, and there have been at times no solutions. For instance, you know when when we had no elected local governments, though district, uh, as in the case of India, is a very strong uh, uh, administrative entity uh, in the provinces. But uh, local governments have been uh, at the district level and sub district level, but provinces have been experimenting with that. The key feature there is the. Uh, is the weakness on the part of the lower tiers of the government when it comes to uh, claiming the share from the provincial resources. So there is a finance commission at the national level, and then there is a finance commission at the provincial level that, that distributes resources uh, vertically between the province and the districts or the local governments, and then uh, among those uh, local governments. Um, and the process is significantly weak. Um, and, and also, it's the... Uh, it's the deployment of the HR from the federal government to the provinces and from provinces to the to the local governments that also uh, has uh, uh, has, has uh, exercised a lot of control o over the local governments. Uh, I, my my question to my Indonesian colleagues uh, would be to know more about how is it that the uh, resource distribution takes place and whether that is. A contested process where there is representation uh, apart from the national government, whether there is representation from the provinces and from various tiers of the local government, or whether it is just a decision at the top level and whatever is considered appropriate for local levels is then passed on uh, to them. Um, I think in the interest of time, I'll probably not go into the other stuff, but thank you very much once again for a very interesting uh, or very interesting presentation by both colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mujib. Um, all right, so our last panelist for this evening, um, last but not least, Ravita, um, we'd love to hear from you now, circling back to, to think about Indonesia with your experience in um, decentralization in Indonesia, just to your observations and any questions that you might have for Oman and Renata. Uh, thanks, Nicola, and good evening. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me to be part of this interesting uh, discussion. Uh, it's very interesting to see how SNGs has been progressing well uh, over the last uh, two decades, uh, so that some have a better uh, capacity to manage resources properly uh, in order for them to provide uh, better public services. I'm certainly a pro decentralization uh, in this regard. <laughs> So I really love to see a data slide uh, about the development of agenda expenditure, especially regarding the significant reduction of personal ex uh, expenditure, which led to the an improvement uh, in health and education ser services. Uh, with uh, of course, with a strong push to 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 uh, yeah uh, be able to oblige with the uh, mandatory uh, percentage of uh, expenditure in this respect. Uh, we have also seen some good uh, practices implemented uh, successfully by local government. I remember when we started this like two decades ago, we tried to promote like participation, participation and transparency at local level. And I'm glad that some regions are still implementing this. I believe this still happening in Makassar with their participatory budgeting. Um, yeah, I must admit that the challenge remain, as Renata mentioned, including on revenue mobilization, capacity constraint, uh, quality issues, uh, coordination. Erman mentioned uh, about like line ministries uh, uh, work together. 
uh, and also about disparity uh, or unequal distribution across region, especially the eastern part of the country. Uh, here, the role of province uh, using Amazon, the missing middle, uh, it, in terms of monitoring is also the key thing. But interesting to see uh, the, the point from ALOC uh, where the monitoring aspect still comes from the central government in Indonesia, in India. Uh, it is unfortunate to see uh, there is uh, an issue related political buy-in from the central, central level to support this and then uh, recentralize some of these functions. And I agree with Arman that this very related to the incentive. Uh, uh, I can see the slide. Uh, Arman has provided the diagram about the incentive for subnational leader. So it would be good to know if there is also analysis done to assess incentive at central level, which made them to adopt uh, recentralization policies. Um, um, yeah, uh, hopefully this is not from the MRS side, yeah. So in interest of time, I don't want to go too much detail about this. Uh, both Renata and Erman have provided many insights, but I would like to ask questions related to the future, yeah. Uh, so my question, and I assume Erman is also pro-decentralization, uh, what strategy uh, needs to be considered so that this recommendation yeah, from both of your presentation in the, uh, can be implemented? Yeah, so le learning from experience. Indonesia is very dependent uh, to on reliable champions yeah, for this to happen. So do we have, we have it now? Uh, can we use province as alliance yeah, to really push the... the yeah, uh, decentralization back to the local government. So yeah, that's from my side. Thank you so much for to be part of this interesting discussion. Thank you very much, Ravita. Okay, so we've got some, we've had some really amazing um, and interesting observations, uh, as well as several different questions coming in. Uh, I wanted to note that on the the Questions coming in from the participants, um, they're still coming, but um, a fantastic effort by uh, Renata and Erman to be keeping responding to, to all of those as they're coming in. Um, but as we, um, we, we've, Marianne was asking about the pace of decentralization and, and sort of early, any, if you have any reflections on the early stage in which Governments are uh, really grappling with this idea of you know which what to decentralize and what not to decentralize. She was interested in the um, special autonomy um, of Papua and some of the asymmetric decentralization. Um, Alec observations on accountability at district level. Um, we have Mujib talking about how resource distribution takes place. Um, and finally, Ravita looking at what strategy is needed for future improvements in, in decentralization. Um, I'm going to just open to, to Renata first and then to Erman, um, and however you'd like to, to sort of respond to and, and um, yeah, those questions and observations. Please go ahead, Renata. Yeah, thank you, Nicola, and thank you, uh, panelists, for the reflection and questions. I will answer uh, as best with uh, my ability. So as uh, in my slide, there is a timeline on how the intergovernmental transfer in Indonesia evolved over time. And uh, so when you ask uh, Marianne, how did it start in the beginning? So we begin with the balancing fund, the what used to be a block grant, to finance uh, personnel, some mandatory uh, uh, services. So that part need to be fulfilled first. And then revenue sharing uh, between central government, province, and district. And I think that's the earliest stage of uh, transfer in Indonesia. That's how we begin. And uh, because with the this, uh, decentralized responsibilities. Local government doesn't have fiscal capacity to perform some of this function. So that's how I think in the beginning, uh, we can start pretty, quite smoothly because 
the decentralized mandates are being funded to a certain uh, percentage, uh, I could say uh, that way. And on your question on uh, the special autonomy fund, um, in our book, we mentioned that the governance problem uh, associated with the special autonomy fund is um, poor governance in terms of lack of transparency, uh, corrupt practices, and misappropriation of fund. So that's the reality of what happened in some district. And I'm not saying that this only happened in Papua. No, this is uh, this could happen anywhere. And uh, every now and then we will have uh, in the in in news uh, where some local government officials, even the uh, the mayor or the uh, governor, are being um, you know, uh, accused of uh, corruption or um, and they're being um, evaluated by the Corruption Eradication uh, Agency. So that's what's happening uh, in the reality in Indonesia. So that's answered your question on the Special Autonomy Fund for, for Papua because the amount of money that's being transferred is quite large. It's 2% of total uh, general allocation fund, which is a substantial amount. And we have, uh, we observed there's a, a clear improvement in some of uh, development indicators like health and education. But again, it doesn't go as much, um, the outcomes is not, comparable to, with the amount of uh, fund dispersed. So that's uh, that's on the special autonomy fund. And uh, on the MME question, that's a very interesting uh, observation, I think from Alok. Uh, uh, for us, I think we're missing the, the comprehensive m &E framework. So it is stated in the regulation that for everything you have to do m &E, right? Uh, I mean, by the book, there should be evaluation and monitoring. But then uh, it's not clearly mandated who should be doing that or if this function can be shared between different um, agencies, ministries. And uh, that's why I think the the implementation is not as comprehensive or structured as we would like to see. Uh, and from the Ministry of Finance perspective, they, I think they focus more on the transaction monitoring. So the amount of money disbursed, will, uh, did you provide correct receipt? Uh, did you fulfill your reporting requirements? But that's, on a very administrative level. And there has been a development of uh, uh, regulations and guidelines on doing the output and outcome uh, evaluation, but I think that's a process that we are still uh, trying to do. So that's an ongoing process. I believe that Edmund can add to this observation. And uh, to Mujit, on how does the resource allocation happen? So different type of transfers are distributed differently. Uh, for, for some, they're formula based. So you take into consideration the size of the local government, number of uh, population, property level, and so on. And uh, even though the basic uh, formula is more or less the same, but then the weighting and then uh, there will be additional variable added or additional uh, or some variable being dropped over time. So the that's what I mean. Uh, I mean by the government is constantly tweaking the formulation to to this distribution, and there transfers that is proposal based. So you create a proposal, especially this is for the specific grants for infrastructure. 
the government already set up a list of which sectors will be supported by this transfer and uh, what are the, the allowable uh, expenditure. And then local government will create a proposal on what they would like to build with this transfer. Say, if this is specific transfer for health infrastructure, then you put uh, the health office will, will fill in a form saying that we will build uh maybe not not uh, enough money for building but we will add facility uh, we will add uh equipment to this health clinic which is say maybe uh the waste management uh or or uh, operating room or something like that so it is a proposal based that's why when you ask about how resources are being allocated. There are different allocation uh, methods for different type of transfer. And I think uh, mostly uh, it's decided from the central, but it's not only by the Minister of Finance. So there are different agencies involved in this, uh, Minister of Finance, the National Planning Agency, and then line ministries uh, related to the sectors uh, being um, that uh, the relevant sector, so Minister of Public Works or Minister of Agriculture, things like that. So uh, I think that's the answers that I can give to uh, panelists. And uh, for Revita, that's a huge reflection. What <laughs> uh, I think uh, my policy recommendation in, in my presentation is pretty much uh, spell out the direction that we think we should take, you know, there's a lot of strengthening. I'm not saying that we are at a really poor condition right now. We, we come from here and we're already here. So there's a lot of tweaking and strengthening and uh, rethinking uh, and reformulating uh, things like incentive, disincentive uh, to, to get the system uh, going to, uh, to produce outcomes that we expect from decentralization. I think that's my uh, response to the panelists. Uh, and I, uh, I hand this to Erman. Yes, okay. thanks. Please go ahead, Erman. Just um, a couple of key observations or responses. Yeah, thank you, Nicola. Thank you, Renata. I think uh, about the asymmetric decentralization uh, uh, to, to Marianne, I think it's uh, my point is that it hasn't been implemented beyond the spatial autonomy regions in Indonesia, and I was calling for applying it. Uh, that's, that's, that's my point, and exactly what, what just, you just said, like how we make centralized and decentralized things and differentiate between urban and rural, different different types of things rather than uniform uh, 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 policies across the board. I think that's, that's exactly what I was uh, recommending. So it, it hasn't happened yet. So that, that's, that's one thing. Uh, and then uh, I think, uh, I hope I, uh, I agree with you. I mean, like it's uh, Indonesia, yeah, we, we are very proud of being a unitary state, but when, when we talk about decentralization, it looks like a federal, uh, very pretty much like a federal federal uh, adopting federal system. But I think the key difference, if we uh, compare it with India, I think the state or the province in Indonesia is the, the key difference, which I think uh, the uh, very limited, I mean, like roles of the province and, and also like the revenue power, uh, based on what you said, I think uh, uh, is, is, is the, the main difference uh, between uh, India and, and Indonesia. And I'm also like interested to learn more about like how the decentralization in India is used to to really improve the the inclusiveness, the 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 just the mean mainstreaming the gender equality and social inclusion, which to me it is uh, it is not there yet, and, and that's exactly what what we are we are recommending uh, uh, for for the future for Indonesia's uh, decentralization uh, in the future. Uh, that's uh, exactly what we we uh, we, we we are proposing. Uh, and about the the M and E system, I think um, it is 
I don't know how, how to say it, but it's uh, basically the the trans. Um, I think the, the 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 focus of the monitoring is more like on the inputs. What as as what Renata said, like whether whether it's like the the the, the uh, whether to buy equipment or to buy to buy to buy to buy something <laughs> to buy uh, what. The, the the fund allocation whether the outcomes or 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 or, or the outputs of of the of the of the funds uh, uh, allocated at the central level and also like everyone is incentivized to 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 create its own monitoring and evaluation systems it's also related to my point about like the the that the mindsets of the most central government officials are still centralized this is like one thing the, the biggest challenge it hasn't changed i mean like i said the centralization has, has been there for 20 years but i don't see the 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 spirit is there across the central government officials not to mention the the politicians the central level the national level politicians and i think it's also i mean like i think one uh, uh, participant asked like with such like good results why there is a tendency of, of, of to, to recentralize and and Rafi also asked like uh, for what what strategy uh, like if we want to support the decentralization what's the strategy? I think it's and it's also like I think um, reflecting the the question if we can go back uh, twenty years ago would we prefer non big bang and more um, evolution transition uh, of the decentralization? I would say, like, if there is, there was no big bang, there was no big momentum, that would never happen. I, I feel that, like, the central government elites, Jakarta elites, don't have any incentives to promote decentralization. You need like people who really, really think like a comprehensively, and then have like that 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 spirit, that 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 mindset, maybe ideology to put to propose, uh, propose decentralization. And now the, the big momentum of 98 is gone. <laughs> so it's like the challenge is to how to, to, to bring this is like a the like a case of like now we, we, we try to, to argue back in the normal situation. And I, I see like the, the blockage, if we see like political map of like central level elites uh, who promote this and the blockage is so strong. And also, like plus the 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 the, the lack of like the, the, the reducing the uh, reduce the quality of democracy and everything. So really, yeah, with Revy, I mean, like let's build the coalition to 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 to, to promote this and and and, um, and and like work with with various various actors to, to to try to promote. But it's really the mainstream is now going back to uh, it's it's really. To decentralize all the incentive systems are uh, uh, are there. I'll stop there, and I think I'm really excited to have like a further discussions with you guys. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eman. Um, thank you, and that brings us to the end of our discussion this evening, which is something of a pity, as it's quite clear that we could continue for some hours to come. Um, I hope you'll thank me, uh, join me in thanking the presenters and panellists for sharing their knowledge and experience with us this evening. And I'm going to hand over to Jamie, who will close the session. Thank you. Super, Nicola. Thank you so much. Uh, and let me add my words of thanks to, to yourself for moderating, to Renata and Herman for excellent presentations. Uh, and, and to the panelists for their insights. Um, we've had a, an exciting conversation with over 100 colleagues uh, around the world, uh, not only to learn about Indonesia, but to share experiences about how, uh, how and under what, what circumstances decentralization can work. Um, first, as a reminder, um, uh, in a few days, you will find the video presentation of today's webinar, as well as the uh, presentation slides on decentralization.net. If you're not already a member of the Local Public Sector Alliance and you think these conversations are useful, please go to the website and sign up as a member. Particularly for this reason, we've set up regional working groups in every global region, including in Asia. Uh, the next Asia working group meeting is on July 11th. If you want to continue this conversation, experience sharing between the Philippines, India, Pakistan, Indonesia, um, that's the platform that we're offering for these um, conversations. And we, of course, want to thank our co-chairs for the Asia Working Group, Rajna Shrestha, Madhavi 
Raja Diksha and Peter Yates that are keeping this group together and keeping these conversations from being a one-off event like this webinar. But once again, thank you very much um, for spending time uh, with us on this interesting conversation. I've learned a lot and I look forward to the next opportunity to interact. But thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.